First, we need to discuss what training to failure even means. There are many ways that failure can be defined, but for this video, there are three criteria that must be met to consider training to true failure. First is the inability to perform another rep. This means literally failing a repetition midway through because you physically couldn't lift the weight. Failure isn't stopping when you think you can't perform any more reps, it is when you attempt a rep and cannot complete it. The second criteria is that failure must occur despite maximal effort. You can't just stop the rep because you are mentally fatigued, this must occur with maximal intent to complete the rep. And lastly, training to failure implies that technique remains strict and effective throughout the set. Technique cannot change in order to continue lifting, it must stay the same as all previous reps. Simply put, your last rep should look exactly the same as your first rep, only slower. So for this video, we will define training to failure as the inability to perform a rep despite maximal effort without deviation in technique. Now that we understand what training to true failure is, let's explore how we can quantify different proximities to failure. This is best achieved using the Reps in Reserve, or RIR scale. This is a numeric system which allows us to quantify how close to failure we train. Essentially, the scale works like this. Zero RIR means that no more full reps could have been performed, otherwise we would have hit failure. One RIR means that one more rep could have been performed in that set before failure. Two RIR means that two more reps could have been performed and so on. So now the question becomes, where on this scale should we be training to maximize muscle growth? Should we always train to complete failure, or should we leave multiple reps in reserve? To answer this, let's first compare how training to failure influences muscle growth versus not training to failure. This topic was explored in this meta-analysis, which gathered all the research comparing failure versus non-failure training. And as we can see, the totality of the evidence showed a slight trend in favour of training to failure compared with not training to failure. This can be seen with this orange diamond, which was towards the right of the midline, meaning it favoured training to failure. However, this wasn't considered a statistically significant finding, as we can see by part of the diamond crossing the midline. Another interesting finding from this paper is one of the subgroup analyses. The only finding which reached statistical significance was in favour of training to failure in trained lifters. What this suggests is that lifters with more training experience may see more of a benefit from failure training compared with novices. This may be because trained lifters require a higher threshold of disruption to cause an adaptation. This is because they have been lifting for a while and resistance training is not a new stimulus to them. So training closer to failure may be required to elicit enough disruption to surpass this adaptation threshold required to stimulate muscle growth. Whereas novice lifters have a much lower threshold for adaptation since training is a novel form of exercise for them. New lifters can pretty much do anything in the gym and achieve a robust hypertrophy stimulus. However, this analysis didn't specify how close to failure the non-failure studies trained with. Did they compare failure training versus leaving 5 reps in reserve, or did they compare it to leaving 1 rep in reserve? The exact proximity to failure that lifters trained with may influence muscle growth outcomes. So let's take a closer look at how training to different proximities to failure may influence muscle growth. This study explored the effects of training with various different proximities to failure on muscle growth. Trainees performed a bench press training program with different proximity to failures in different groups. This study used velocity loss as a gauge of fatigue throughout a set and therefore a gauge of proximity to failure. One group trained with no velocity loss, the second group trained with 15% velocity loss, the third group with 25% velocity loss, and the last group with 50% velocity loss. So what this means is that the groups training with a higher velocity loss are training closer to failure, while the groups training with a lower velocity loss are further from failure. It was found that training closer to failure resulted in superior growth of the pecs compared with training further from failure. Although there didn't seem to be much difference between the 25 and 50% velocity loss groups. So overall, the relationship between proximity to failure and hypertrophy may hypothetically look something like this. 
Training too far from failure may just not stress the muscles enough to stimulate much muscle growth. But once we start getting closer to failure, there is exponentially more stress. Then once we have reached a point close to failure, there probably isn't much additional benefit for training to complete failure versus leaving a few reps in reserve. Furthermore, it seems that training closer to failure may be more or less important when training with different loads and rep ranges. When training with lighter loads, it is probably more important to train closer to failure, and when lifting heavier loads, we can probably train a little further from failure and still achieve similar muscle growth. This is thought to be explained by Henneman's size principle of motor unit recruitment. Essentially, this principle states that muscle fibers are recruited in order of requirement. If we are lifting a lighter load, then only some of the fibers are required to move the weight, because they can produce enough force alone. But if we lift a heavier load, then all fibers need to kick in to contribute to force production. Furthermore, as we train closer and closer to failure, more fibers are required due to fatigue of the working fibers. So if we take a set to failure or very close to failure, then all fibers will eventually be recruited and trained even when lifting with lighter loads. This idea was illustrated in this study which explored the effects of training to failure versus not to failure with lighter and heavier loads. Trainees performed leg extensions with 80% 1RM in one group and 30% 1RM in another group. In each group, lifters trained all sets to failure with one of their legs, and not to failure with the other leg. After 8 weeks, it was found that when training with the heavier load, there was not much difference in quad growth whether sets were taken to failure or not. However, for the light load, there was significantly greater growth in the leg training to failure compared with the leg not training to failure. This idea led this research review suggesting that when training on the heavier end of the hypertrophy range, around 6 to 12 reps, stopping a few reps short of failure probably won't compromise muscle growth to any significant degree. However, when training on the lighter end of the hypertrophy spectrum, around 13 to 20 reps, sets should probably be taken closer to failure, around 0 to 2 reps in reserve, to ensure all motor units are recruited and trained to maximize hypertrophy. Furthermore, we also need to consider the effects of training to failure on fatigue, which may indirectly influence muscle growth via its impact on lifting performance. How close to failure we train can impact fatigue in three different ways. First is the impact of fatigue within a training session. As we have all experienced, we are stronger at the beginning of a workout compared with the end of a workout, especially if we are focusing on a single muscle group. This is because each set results in fatigue, which carries on to each subsequent set, resulting in lower force capabilities. As a result, we can't lift as much load or perform as many reps as a workout goes on. Now, this isn't a major issue, because lifting performance isn't directly correlated with the hypertrophic stimulus of a session. There are many instances where training under fatigue can still produce robust muscle growth. This can be seen with many metabolite techniques like drop sets, myo reps, and pre-fatigue strategies, where performance is compromised but muscle growth is still achieved, and even comparable to traditional training. However, with all other factors equated, it still may be beneficial for lifting performance to be enhanced. This is potentially why we tend to see superior muscle growth when implementing longer rest periods and higher frequencies. For example, this study explored the effects of training with 1 versus 3 minutes rest between sets on muscle growth. As we can see in the orange bars, it was found that the longer rest periods resulted in superior growth of all muscles compared with the shorter rest periods. This may be a result of the longer rest periods allowing trainees to perform a greater total volume load throughout the training program meaning they were able to perform more reps or load with each set compared with the short rest group. Although this study was on rest periods, which is a separate topic, it demonstrates that too much fatigue accumulation within a session may compromise muscle growth to some extent. So going back to how this relates to proximity to failure, if we train too or very close to failure too frequently at the beginning of a session, it may compromise lifting performance for subsequent exercises in the workout. For example, let's say we performed a push day which includes 4 sets of bench press, 4 sets of incline dumbbell press, 3 sets of lateral raises, 
three sets of cable flies, three sets of skull crushers, and three sets of tricep pushdowns. If we take all four sets of bench press and incline dumbbell press to failure at the beginning of the session, our performance of the flies, lateral raises, and triceps training will probably be compromised to some extent. However, if we performed all sets of lateral raises, flies, and triceps training to failure, it probably won't impact other exercises because they don't have overlapping muscles in subsequent exercises. So as a general rule, we may want to train slightly further from failure for exercises performed at the beginning of a session, and we can probably train closer to failure for exercises performed towards the end of the session. Another form of fatigue that may be influenced by proximity to failure is session to session fatigue. This refers to how one workout impacts subsequent workouts. Training closer to failure tends to result in more disruption compared with non-failure training. This includes more muscle damage, soreness, and hormonal changes. On one hand, this could be seen as a good thing as it will likely result in a superior hypertrophy stimulus. But on the other hand, it may not be ideal in certain situations. This is because these markers of fatigue may inhibit lifting performance in the following few days post-training, if the stimulus was hugely disruptive. So throughout the course of the week, the overall training stimulus may actually be superior by training slightly further from failure, as it can allow greater overall lifting performance. However, this is only really a concern in a couple of unique situations. First is if you were training the same muscle on consecutive days. Most training programs don't include this structure, but some certainly do. However, as long as you have at least one day rest between training the same muscle group, lifting performance is unlikely to be inhibited by the previous session. So if you were training a muscle on consecutive days, it may be worth training slightly further from failure on average. And the other situation where this may be a concern is for novel exercises. When introducing a new exercise into a training routine, we are more sensitive to its effects. So training very close to failure with a novel exercise can often result in excessive soreness and fatigue for multiple days post-training. This may carry on to the next time the muscle is trained, even if it is multiple days later, and inhibit lifting performance. So when introducing a new exercise into a routine, it may be worth staying a few reps shy of failure until you have become accustomed to it. And the last form of fatigue that proximity to failure can influence is systemic fatigue. This is not a very well-defined term, but it can generally be described as global fatigue of the entire organism. Excessive systemic fatigue has been thought to result in hormonal changes, negative mood states, and decreased lifting performance, which may inhibit long-term muscle growth. It has been theorized that training closer to failure may induce greater systemic fatigue, this was found in this study, which compared hormonal changes when training to failure versus not to failure. As we can see, the group training to failure, represented by the blue line, tended to see elevations in cortisol throughout the training program, while the group not training to failure, represented by the orange line, tended to see decreases in cortisol, which is thought to be a marker of catabolism. Furthermore, the group training to failure tended to experience slight decreases in testosterone, while the group not training to failure tended to experience an increase in testosterone throughout the training program, which is thought to be an anabolic hormone. However, hormonal changes within the normal physiological range aren't really a great indicator of actual muscle growth, so this should be interpreted with caution. However, it does provide some evidence that training closer to failure may result in greater systemic fatigue compared with not training to failure. So the recommendation here would be that trainees may want to avoid excessive training to failure for all sets of all exercises to minimize the potential for excessive long-term systemic fatigue. So taking all of this information into consideration, let's explore some practical recommendations. Like we established earlier, proximity to failure may hypothetically follow this general relationship. So in most cases, we probably want to train at least fairly close to failure, beyond around this threshold here, to induce the majority of adaptation. Then training beyond this point may also be beneficial, but not have as much additional benefit. Furthermore, training closer to failure seems to be slightly more beneficial for advanced lifters compared with novice lifters, 
as they require a more disruptive stimulus to see a hypertrophy response. It also seems to be more important to train closer to failure when using lighter loads and higher rep ranges to ensure all muscle fibers are recruited and trained. We should also understand that proximity to failure can influence fatigue within a session, between sessions, and from a long-term systemic perspective. Therefore, we may want to be wise about when we decide to train to true failure and how often we do so. As a general guide, we may want to train further from failure when training with heavier loads, with less than around 10 reps, for exercises performed earlier in the training session, when we are less experienced in lifting, and when we introduce new exercises into a training routine. In this case, we can probably train with around 3-4 to four reps in reserve. On the other hand, we may benefit from training closer to failure when training with lighter loads, above around 10 reps, for exercises performed towards the end of a workout, for more advanced lifters, and once we are accustomed to an exercise. In this case, we can train with around 0 to 1 reps in reserve. And for all other situations between these two extremes, trainees can individualize their proximity to failure based on the situation. Thanks for watching, and hopefully, you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks, and more.